Electrolysis means splitting using electricity. The thing that's being split will be a compound, specifically an ionic compound. This is important because only charged particles can conduct electricity, and covalent compounds aren't made of charged particles. We call this ionic compound that we're splitting an electrolyte. Now, ionic compounds form lattices, 3D structures made of thousands of positive and negative ions bonded together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction acting in all directions, or an ionic bond for short. Those ionic bonds are incredibly strong. So if we tried to carry out electrolysis on a solid ionic compound at room temperature, then it wouldn't work because the ions wouldn't be free to move. In order for the ions to be able to move so we can split them up, the lattice has to be broken apart. You can do this in two ways, either by heating the compound, usually to a really high temperature because the bonds are so strong, or by dissolving it in water, making it what we call an aqueous solution. So we're going to look at how these two methods work, starting with a molten compound, as that's the easier situation. We have a vessel full of electrolyte. Remember, that's our ionic compound. It's made up of positive metal ions and negative non-metal ions. In the example here, let's say that we have positive lead ions and negative bromide ions. Important tip, remember that non-metal elements like bromine, chlorine and oxygen form ions whose names end with ide, bromide, chloride, oxide. You won't get the marks in an electrolysis question if you start talking about an oxygen ion. Now just to make this a little bit easier to follow, I'm going to reduce the number of ions down to a small handful so you can see where the individual ions are going and what's happening to them. So we have these positive lead ions. We call these cations. Any positive ion is a cation. My chemistry teacher used to say, a cation carries a positive charge. Kind of sad, but also kind of memorable. When the current flows through these electrodes, these inert conducting rods, one electrode will become negative because it acquires a lot of extra electrons. Since opposites attract, the positive cations are attracted to this negative electrode. Since they're a pair, we give them similar names. We call this electrode the cathode. Meanwhile, there are these negative bromide ions. We call these anions. Any negative ion is an anion. While the cathode is becoming negative, the other electrode is becoming positive, and again, opposites attract. So the anions go here. We call this electrode the anode. Now, when these charged ions reach the electrodes, they're either going to gain or lose electrons and become uncharged. We call this process being discharged. If you're sitting higher tier, you need a little more detail at this point, because you need to be able to write something called a half equation to show what's going on. My positive lead cation has a two plus charge. This means it has two more protons than electrons. When it formed a compound, it gave some electrons away to the bromide ions, and therefore it's got this residual positive charge. When it reaches the negative cathode, it picks up two electrons. We say that it's been discharged. You hopefully remember from your redox reactions that oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, or oil rig for short. The lead ion has gained electrons, so it has been reduced. We can write this with a half equation like this. A similar thing happens at the anode, only it's slightly more complicated, and that's true for pretty much all of these. My negative bromide ion, remember bromide, not bromine, has a single negative charge. That means it has one more electron than protons. So when it reaches the positive anode, because it has that extra electron, it's going to lose it. Again, we say it is discharged, it stopped being charged. We already said that oxidation is loss, so it's been oxidised, it's lost electrons. Now here's the tricky part. When bromine isn't an ion, it doesn't go around as a single atom. It goes around as what we call a divalent molecule. That's a molecule made of two atoms covalently bonded together. So although one ion is going to follow this equation that we've got here, it's not going to stay in that form. It's going to form this molecule with two atoms in it. So this one ion gives up its one electron, but at the same time, a second ion also gives up an electron. So when it comes to writing a half equation, we have two bromide ions going to a bromine molecule with two atoms in it and two electrons. So just to recap, so far we have electrolysis means splitting compounds apart back into the elements they're made of using electricity. It only happens to ionic compounds, not covalent ones. The material you're splitting is called the electrolyte and that electrolyte needs to be either molten, so a liquid, or dissolved in order for the ions to be able to move. Positive ions are called cations, and they are attracted to the cathode, where they are reduced, 
The negative ions are anions, and they are attracted to the anode, where they are oxidised. You need to be able to predict what the products of electrolysis will be. Now, for a molten compound, this is pretty straightforward, as long as you can work out what element has given rise to the negative ion. So, for instance, say we have lead bromide. Lead is the metal, therefore it has made the positive ions. Positive ions are cations, therefore they go to the cathode. Bromide ions have come from the element bromine. It's a non-metal because it's on the right-hand side of the periodic table. So those anions are going to go to the anode. Just remember that you're saying that the product is bromine, not bromide. It's only called bromide when it's in its iron form. Pause the video for just a second and just double check that you can work out what the products of the other four electrolytes will be. So hopefully you've got that aluminium oxide will make aluminium and oxygen, copper sulphide will make copper and sulphur, tin chloride will make tin and chlorine, and sodium fluoride will make sodium and fluorine. You should be able to talk about how electrolysis can be used, specifically extracting metals. You do need to know about one specific example, which is the extraction of aluminium. Everything we've said so far is true. It's extracted from a molten ionic compound, specifically aluminium oxide. That's actually mixed up with a mineral called cryolite, and that's in there to disrupt the ionic lattice, and it means that the aluminium oxide will melt at a slightly lower temperature, which is going to save you energy and therefore money. It's a similar idea to why you put salt on the roads when it's really cold. It just means that things can be a liquid at a slightly lower temperature. Now you can see from this picture that the electrolysis vessel itself is actually the negative electrode. So what that's going to mean is that when the positive aluminium cations are attracted to the cathode, they're all going to fall down to the bottom of the reaction vessel. And that's going to make it really, really easy to tap that aluminium off. Meanwhile, the negative oxide anions are all going to be attracted to the positive anode and oxygen gas is going to be released there. One other thing that you need to know is that these electrodes are made of graphite because it's really good at conducting electricity and also it's really quite unreactive. However, at the kind of high temperatures that aluminium is being electrolyzed at, even something as unreactive as graphite is going to start to react. So when you've got oxygen gas pouring off at hundreds of degrees C, it will start to react with the carbon in the graphite. And so actually, over time, these graphite electrodes get worn away because they're basically just turning into carbon dioxide. So this process is quite expensive because it needs a lot of electricity, it needs a lot of heat energy to melt the aluminium oxide, and also you have to keep replacing the electrodes because they keep wearing away. Again, if you're sitting higher tier, then you need to be able to write half equations for what's happening to both sets of ions. So, your positive aluminium ions, they've got a 3 plus charge, that means they're going to need 3 electrons to each turn back into an aluminium atom. And then, like we said before, the negative ions are always the more complicated ones. Every oxide ion needs to lose two electrons, but oxygen doesn't go around as single atoms. It goes around as these divalent molecules. So instead, we're going to have two oxide ions, each losing two electrons. That's four in total. And so you end up with an oxygen molecule and four electrons. So that was all about molten compounds, ones that have been heated up until they're liquids. The alternative is that you dissolve something in water, so it's a solution. It's aqueous. When we electrolyze a solution, we have an added complication. We obviously have the same positive and negative ions, the cations and anions that we started with, but we now also have some ions that come from the water. H plus ions and OH minus ions, which are also called hydroxide ions. So the basic principle is the same. Positive cations go to the negative cathode because opposites attract. Negative anions go to the positive cathode because opposites attract. Here's the tricky bit. Only one of each type of iron will be discharged. So there are three rules that you need to know. Firstly, the most reactive cation stays in solution. So potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, iron, zinc, almost every metal you can think of will stay in solution. The exception are the metals that are less reactive than hydrogen. That's copper, silver, gold, platinum, your jewellery metals. Remember, when you're writing half equations for these, the cation will pick up the right number of electrons to equalise its positive charge. Rule number two, if there is a halide ion, it will be discharged. So if you electrolyse sodium chloride solution, you'll have chlorine produced at the negative electrode, because chloride is a halide ion, it's from group 7. If you electrolyse aluminium fluoride solution, then you would produce fluorine at the negative electrode. If you don't have a halide, so if you have a sulphate, or a carbonate, or a nitrate, or a phosphate, or whatever else, then the hydroxide ion wins and it will be discharged. 
so you don't need to know the discharge rules for any anion except for the halides and hydroxides. Now when hydroxide ions are discharged, what you get being released is actually oxygen. The half equation for this is definitely one to write on a flashcard and stick to your bedroom wall because it is a real pain to figure out under pressure in the exam. Finally, don't forget that electrolysis of a solution is one of your named required practicals. This means you need to be really confident about describing how it's carried out, what the setup will be, what the equipment you need is, how to do the method. The specification also says that for this practical, you should be making a hypothesis. Well, the only thing that you can really make a hypothesis about is which gases will be produced. So make sure you're confident describing your gas tests. Oxygen relights a glowing splint. And if you have hydroxide ions being discharged, you will produce oxygen. Hydrogen burns rapidly with a squeaky pop when it's ignited. Chlorine will bleach damp litmus paper. Let's just quickly take four examples to show how this would pan out. So let's say we start off with copper sulfate solution. So we've got copper ions, we've got sulfate ions, and then from the water there are hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. When it comes to the cathode, remember we said the more reactive one stays in solution. So in this instance it's the hydrogen. We're going to have copper metal being produced. So our hydrogen test will be negative, we won't see anything, we won't hear anything. At our anode, the rule was either we get a halide being produced, or if there's no halide, the hydroxide is discharged and we get oxygen. Well, we don't have a halide here, we've got sulphate. So our hydroxide is going to be discharged and we're going to get oxygen. That means that we'll see a glowing splint being relit. If we take potassium sulphate, on the other hand, potassium is more reactive than hydrogen. So the potassium stays in solution, the hydrogen comes out. If we do the squeaky pop test, we will see this little explosion, we will hear this squeaky pop sound. But again, we've got no halide, so the hydroxide ion will be discharged and we'll have oxygen. We can relight a glowing splint. If we take sodium chloride solution, sodium is more reactive than hydrogen, so sodium stays in the solution, and instead hydrogen gas is produced, so we'll get a positive squeaky pop test. And then this time, we do have a halide, we do have chloride ions, so they will be discharged, and damp litmus paper would be bleached by this. Finally, if we look at silver nitrate, silver is less reactive than hydrogen, it's one of those jewellery metals, so the hydrogen will stay in solution, the silver metal will be collected, so we're not going to have a positive test for hydrogen, and then again, we don't have a halide, we don't have an ion from group 7, so there's nothing there to be discharged, so instead, it's not the nitrate, that's not going to happen, we're going to have the hydroxide ion being discharged, and that will produce oxygen, so again, our glowing splint will relight. So to summarise all that, Electrolysis is splitting a molten or aqueous ionic compound, called the electrolyte, using electricity. Positive cations are attracted to the cathode where they are reduced. Negative anions are attracted to the anode where they are oxidised. Electrolysis can be used to extract metals like aluminium. This is expensive due to high energy and electricity costs and the need to replace the electrodes. In solutions, certain ions are preferentially discharged. The less reactive cation and halides followed by hydroxides.